lifestyle. And we're so happy you're here with us today. Uh, my name's Teresa, and I'm here with my friend Val. Um, we're both single moms who work for an organization called Adopt for Life. Um, I'm one of the regional parent liaisons with the organization, and Val is our community engagement liaison. Um, and this is our first webinar together, so bear with us as we uh, um, reach some bumps along the road uh, through the presentation. Um, we have a number of people who've joined us already, and there's likely more to trickle in over the next 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and I'm sure people will come and go throughout the presentation, especially given that uh, it's a Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon, I guess now, um, and we're all a, a bunch of um, single parents. Um, <laughs> Um, some of the people I'm seeing um, are new names, um, so I just want to do a quick hello and welcome and tell you a bit about Adopt for Life. Um, we support adoptive families and families who've been touched uh, by adoption all over Ontario, including those involved with kinship, fostering, adoptees themselves, birth families, professionals, anyone who's been part of an adoption journey. Our role is to provide resources, support and advocacy, as well as education to these families on, the, on their journeys. Um, if you're not already a member of Adopt for Life, uh, it's free to join and we'd love to have you. Um, our web address will be noted at the end of the presentation. So please go there, click on your community, um, and then join our community and fill in the form. Again, we'll have a slide a little bit later that I'll guide you through that process um, if you're not already a member. Um, and then once you've kind of completed that online form, a member of our team will res respond to your request. Um, and depending on whether you're an awaiting parent um, or already an adoptive parent, you'll be connected with your parent liaison um, in your area and given the links to our Facebook groups. Um, if you're an adoptive parent, we do what's called an intake. Um, and so that's um, to uh, get to know you and, and uh, any of your support needs. Um, and then once um, we kind of do that process, we're able to add you into our Facebook groups um, and provide you anything that you need. Uh, I'm excited to be here and this is a much needed webinar, um, but I'm sure given the amount of information we can um, go into, this is only just gonna touch on the basics. Um, the, we are recording and you will be sent a, a copy of the recording as well. Um, or if you're watching this at a later date and you have any questions, feel free to reach out to myself or to Val. Our contact information will be later in the presentation um, or Adopt for Life for your own parent liaison. Um, but so you know who we are and why you should be listening to us, uh, we thought we'd do a quick introduction of who we are. So my name is Teresa. Uh, I'm a single parent to an incredible uh, little girl who's nine years old and adopted through the foster care system. Um, she was initially placed with me under a foster to adopt umbrella um, due to so, some outstanding legal issues at the time. Um, but she's been with me four and a half years now and we finalized just over three years ago. She has complex medical needs and developmental delays. Um, so our life is anything but boring, um, but uh, she's taught me to twerk uh, and has given me a renewed perspective on life and I'm so grateful to be her mom. Um, and I really do love being a single parent. I'm also a registered nurse um, who's worked in child welfare and these kids and families have such a special place in my heart. Um, and I'm so happy to be here sharing my experience with you today and hopefully inspiring and encouraging some single parents out there toward their adoption journey. And on that note, Val's gonna tell you a little about herself. Hi, so I'm a single parent of two kids, uh, older kids than Teresa's. <coughs> My son is 23 now. Um, I had him with his dad um, a long time ago and um, we separated when he was 18 months old and his dad and I continued to co-parent um, after a certain point in different countries. Um, my daughter is 16 and I adopted her from foster care when she was 14 and I became a single parent through choice this time. So I have experience of um, going from couple to single and from choosing single parenthood from the start. Um, I have experience with different special needs, uh, ADHD, learning disabilities, complex trauma and um, I love being a parent also and um, I've been a single parent for so long now that I don't even think of myself as a single parent. I just think of myself as a parent. Um, I'm really glad that you're all going to be joining us today and that we can talk with you a bit more and hopefully reassure you and answer some questions. Oh. Okay, there we go. Um, so uh, today we're going to um, go through um, this 
well, seasons of single parenting overlap with two parent families. Uh, there are many things that are unique to single parent adoption. So we thought we'd approach this um, as we go through the life cycle um, of single parenting, if you will. Um, but throughout this, keep in mind, this is just the beginning of the discussion. And we really, really hope that this is just a starting place um, and that we'll continue the discussion, um, whether in our online single parents group, um, in our up and coming virtual support group, through emails or meetups, um, or through future webinars. Um, but if today brings outstanding questions or a lot of interest in a particular topic, um, or something you wish to delve into more, please mention this as we'd be more than happy to talk about it after, do more specific webinars in the future, or perhaps even bring some experts from the community. We also want to acknowledge that within the single parent um, adoptive community, um, there are many um, different paths to parenting here. So even amongst Val and myself, um, we have those who are single parents by choice, um, as in those who pursued adoption as a single. Um, we also have those who became single parent caregivers for grandchildren, nieces and nephews, um, friends, kids, etc. And then we have those who entered adoption as two parent families, but for a variety of reasons are now single parenting. We also know that the majority of single parent adoptions are done by females, um, but we want to make sure we acknowledge that uh, the single dads out there um, are, are a group of, in and of themselves, um, and there are some differences in the process for them as well. Each of these experiences are unique and have slightly different perks and challenges. Um, and while we'll touch briefly on these um, differences, we, we certainly won't delve deep into those today. Uh, I also know there are many of you out there um, who are scared to pursue adoption as a single or worried about the biases um, and that, that perhaps you won't be chosen as a parent because you're single. Um, one parent I spoke with recently said that she had one agency's worker tell her um, that they believe children need two parent families and she had a different agency that say that she wasn't chosen for one match for the same reasons. Um, so unfortunately these biases do still exist. Um, but also know that the vast majority of practitioners um, do believe in single parent uh, adopter, adoptees or adopters um, and do see the incredible contribution um, we make to healthy families for children coming from hard places. Um, there will always be people who think one way or the other, um, but, you, uh, but know that you can do this and you and your children can thrive. Many people know we as singles make great families and they will cheer us on. And with that said, I thought I would pass on an interesting and uplifting piece of information that was recently shared with me. Uh, statistics, in fact, indicate that single parent adoptions are the most successful adoptions. So just take that in for a moment. Uh, single parent adoptions are statistically the most successful. So take a breath, pat yourselves on the back, uh, and know that you've got this, we've got this, uh, and know that you can share that several research studies have shown this and shown that um, children raised by single adoptive parents experience outcomes that are as good or better than those children adopted by couples. I think the reasons behind this are multifactorial, um, but generally for children coming out of the child welfare system, a single parent family can offer the intense one-to-one -one attention which parenting a child like this requires. With that said, it's certainly not buttercups and rainbows all the times as much as I would like it to be. Uh, single parenting can be really hard, it can be lonely, and a support network is vital. Uh, but we're here to, to say uh, to you today that you're not alone in it um, and that we'd love to guide and support you on this journey. Okay, so I'm just going to pick up where Teresa left off um, and share with you my experience. Um, if you're an awaiting parent just now and you're worried about not being matched as a single, um, I was actually matched pretty fast. Um, as I mentioned, my daughter was older when we were matched and uh, older kids have a say in who is going to adopt them. And she was presented with a couple and she was presented with me as a single. And she was drawn to things about my personality, my experience, my interests, uh, the fact that I lived in a city. Um, and by all accounts, she made the choice very fast and her workers very much supported her in that choice because they could tell that there was going to be a good chemistry between us. Um, so please, if you're waiting, um, don't worry. Uh, the good workers <laughs> are going to look at chemistry, they're going to look at uh, families case by case, and, um, and you do have a good chance of finding your kids. We just had someone raise their hand, so I just want yeah. to can you can you message us to, to let us know what the... Specific problem. 
No. All right, we'll keep going. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about some of the things that make us excellent parents as single parents, particularly to adoptive kids. Um, so keep these in mind um, if you're having a difficult time or if you're waiting for that match to happen. Um, first of all, single parents can give their undivided attention to kids. Um, and that can be pretty special, particularly for a child who's coming from a hard place and moving in, going through a difficult transition. Um, often children in the, the early months and even early years of adoption can be quite clingy to their parents. Um, they're gonna, they're gonna want to talk a lot. Or they're maybe gonna have a lot of big emotions to share. Um, sometimes there's gonna be behaviors. So the fact that you as a single parent don't have to divide your attention between your child or your children and a spouse is actually a plus. Um, and often if you speak with the grown up children of single parents, they'll tell you that they were very close to their parent and, um, and they keep a lifelong connection that's, that's really quite special. Um, Another strength in single parent families um, is for some children who've gone through trauma, being with a single parent family is actually preferable to a couple. So um, I'm talking about cases where the child has experienced physical or sexual abuse or very severe um, verbal abuse. They may associate all these negative experiences in their lives um, with a parent or with uh, caregivers and grown ups of that same gender as their abuser, and they may actually have a preference for a single parent. Um, so you will sometimes see that in a child's profile that they're specifically looking, for example, for a single mother. Um, and that's where you can really play a vital role in a child's life and helping them to heal. Another strength for single parents is that you get to make all the decisions. <laughs> so that means you're not having arguments with a spouse about being on the same page. You know, one of you saying your kids can stay up till 10 o'clock, one till nine o'clock. Um, you can be consistent, you can set the ground rules. If you notice that your kid is struggling with something, if you suspect that they have mental health issues, a learning disability, um, anything that needs some kind of specialist attention, Sometimes when you have a partner, uh, there's one of you who lags behind in recognizing that something's not quite right with your child. But when you're alone, if you have that gut feeling, you can act on it straight away, not waste any time, get the specialist help that your kid needs. Um, so often uh, what I see around me is that single parents are dynamic parents. Um, some of the challenges that you're going to face as a single parent are actually the opposite side of the coin of things that are strengths. Um, in that first year, when your child is like a bottomless pit of needs at times, uh, it's going to be exhausting. Uh, when you have a child who's clinging to you, who's melting down, who's crying, who's angry, um, it, it can really wear you down. And if you can't leave the room or you can't leave the house and go for a walk around the block that can be tough um, and that those are the times when you wish that you had someone to tag team with um, another surprisingly difficult thing can be when the good stuff happens um, for me sometimes uh, you know for example this afternoon I'm going to my daughter's dance recital and um, I'm fortunate enough this time that I'm meeting up with another single parent. Um, I passed dance recitals, I've gone alone and I look around and see all the couples and the grandparents um, watching their kids on stage and I get a little twinge and I wish I had someone to, to smile at when, uh, when my daughter comes on stage and to share the photos with. Um, same thing, you know, first steps, uh, first day of school, it's always nice to have someone to share those milestones with. Um, and then the third thing, making parenting choices alone. So that is a positive, but it's also a negative. Sometimes it can feel quite overwhelming um, and you're doing a lot of soul searching, wondering if you're doing things right. And you don't have anybody to bounce those things off in the moment at home. Um, so what I suggest is 
and this is going to come up again and again <laughs> from Teresa and I, is make sure that you have your network in place. It's really important that not just that you have friends, but that you have people who are really engaged with your child as well. And they're, they're rooting for your child and they're rooting for you. Um, make sure that you have people who can step in and give you a break, babysitters, family members, friends, um, and try and set that up before you adopt. So you know that you have that safety net there before you get started. It's a lot harder to go out and make new friends and connections once, once you're in the trenches. Um, for the milestones as well, you know, try and get someone along with you. Just, um, I find uh, sharing on Instagram, my, my daughter has a bit of a fan club. <laughs> and, um, people are always, you know, asking how things are going for her and they're kind of up to date with what's happening in her life. And that has, that has really helped us feel like we're part of a bigger family and a community. Um, for making parenting choices alone, um, as well as calling on your own network, that's actually something uh, you can get help with from Adopt for Life. Um, we've had three or four fairly significant uh, crises in the 18 months that um, I've been an adoptive parent, and I've reached out to my regional parent liaison from Adopt for Life, who's Jessica, um, and I've talked things through with her. There's been times when she sat and listened as I bent it for a very long time, and there's been other times when she's gone off, done a little bit of research and come back and told me about a therapist that could help us or an organization we should try. Um, another thing is that if you reach out to Adopt for Life, to your regional parent liaison, they can find you a buddy. So someone that um, is in a similar parenting situation as you. And uh, sometimes that person is, is there for meetups. Sometimes they're there just to text when you're going through a tantrum or something. Um, and if ever you have to go to uh, a meeting, you need advocacy help, for example, um, if your child has special education needs and you have an IEP meeting at their school, um, you don't want to face the principal and six teachers alone, then you can ask for um, your regional parent liaison to go with you and help either take notes or prompt you to ask the questions you wanted to ask. So just... Um, make sure you have things set up so that you're not alone as a single parent. So we thought we would, uh, in our little life cycle, go through uh, from the beginning of awaiting parents. We've kind of touched on certain pieces um, and I won't go into the details of how to adopt. Um, if you have questions about that, please don't hesitate to reach out after. Um, but I do want to talk about some of the unique pieces of uh, uh, to awaiting parents uh, who are singles. So in general, um, it's a good idea for anyone making the decision to adopt to explore why it is you want a child. Experience has shown that the urge to parent comes primarily from a desire to meet our own needs. Um, that if that urge comes from that desire, such as loneliness, disappointment in romantic relationships, unresolved fertility or other losses, uh, parenting will prove far more challenging and less satisfying for both, of, for both you and your child. However, if your desire to parent arises from a wish to meet a child's needs um, and to enjoy a relationship with him or her, adoption has a greater chance of, pos of a positive outcome. As a single parent, you also need to consider your support system, your job, and your finances. Once you've considered all this, and if you decide to move forward, there are additional things you need to consider. I mentioned already about these outdated biases um, that still exist with regard to single parenting, so it's incredibly important to be thoughtful in your decisions and how you present yourself, both in person as well as online, um, and in the kind of children you take on. And although the desire to adopt is an emotional one, the more realistic you are uh, in your expectations, the more likely you will be to complete a successful adoption and to develop a satisfying relationship uh, with your child lifelong. Learn as much as you can about the core issues of adoption, the impact of trauma on children, and the special needs that may, many adopted children experience um, can increase your chances for success. I spoke with an adoption worker about her thoughts on single parenting, um, and she had this advice to give. She said, from my perspective, the number one most important factor for single applicants is informed support. 
I believe that it's imperative that first of all, the support people are identified early on in the process, and then that the applicant teaches their supports about child welfare adoption, including the impact of developmental trauma, abuse, neglect, multiple moves, prenatal exposure to substances, the attachment process, and all the reasons why adoptive parent will be different for all involved. Supports need to truly understand why and how a child's grief can play out in an adoptive home and family. How does your reactive behaviors for what they are and not just as bad. Give adoption parenting and attachment books to these supports to read and that'll be a good test of their commitment. As the applicant goes through pride training, etc., they must pass these lessons on to their supports. This is particularly important for parents and extended family of app applicants who need to learn to see through the adoption lens, which will reduce judgment and promote compassion. Thirdly, singles need supports who will allow them to vent without presuming that they're throwing in the towel or full of regret. In the absence of a partner with a shared experience, supports need to be able to listen and accept a good dump of whatever may, whatever may come out on a bad or sad day. Applicants have told me that when they have been presented for a child who they are not matched with in the end, it can feel like a miscarriage as the child already connected to their heart. Again, singles need compassion compassionate, understanding supports who can receive this grief and sadness with some insight. Of course, this is important for all adoptive applicants, but so much more for singles. They need their support peeps for emotional support, competent childcare, breaks, speed dial, venting, dumping, etc. Said if I were considering families who were a prospective match for a child and a single applicant was able to indicate that there is an informed adoption competent team behind them and could speak to all that went into making this happen, that would set them apart for me. I think that really kind of summarizes it all. Um, um, so, oh, go ahead. Here from uh, from Crystal, and so she's talking about supports um, and how every podcast, every webinar talks about supports, but she's not sure um, how to go about setting up supports because realistically, we're single. Supports are limited. Um, so I can maybe. Speak to that a little we're going to touch on it again but um, I, I as you can hear I'm not Canadian <laughs> all of my family is in another country um, I literally uh, my son and I were the only family members here and um, the friends that I have um, who I went through the getting ready process for adoption with uh, many of them I don't see much of them anymore um, but I have been able to build up a really solid support system. Um, and a lot of that was, was by making sure I got to know other adoptive parents. Um, so a few ways that you can go about doing that. Um, if you live close enough, you can go to one of the, the meetups. Uh, I go to the monthly groups um, with Adopt for Life. Uh, CES runs some as well. Um, Adoption Council Ontario, has some groups as well and um and get out there and meet other families who are going through what you're going through um supports don't have to be in person you can talk with people via facebook groups on forums um at any time of day or night and there's always going to be another parent who's awake and who can who can respond um so that's something that you can do on on our facebook groups um and also, if you're feeling isolated, you can you can reach out and let your regional parent liaison know, and they will make efforts to check in on you, and they'll also make sure that you're connected with somebody with another parent you can phone up. Um, I, I have one more thought on supports pathways. Um, something that I did six weeks after adopting was pathways training, which is with Adoption Council Ontario. Uh, it's similar to Pride, except for this time you have a kid in your house and all the stuff is no longer theoretical, it's real. Um, so it was a really solid um, course on therapeutic parenting. Um, you get to meet a lot of other families there and your children have free childcare provided. So they also have that therapeutic support of meeting other kids who are going through what they're going through. Um, so that is how you can enlarge your support system. Anything you'd want to add to that, Teresa? 
Yeah, so I think it, it so much depends on your own circumstances um, and I think on the age of your kids as well. Um, so I think um, when you're adopting a younger child, in some ways it's easier because there are lots of um, like parenting groups you can go to, especially when you're on adoption leave. So go out to the early year center, go to library groups, um, all that kind of thing. Um, once your children are school age, try to get involved um, in whatever ways you can. Again, I know it's so hard as a single parent when you're um, working full time and like running from place to place to place to place. Um, so do what you can. Um, I'll talk a little bit later as well about um, so finding, so doing things like um, uh, if you have some local friends, um, get together and meal prep together. Um, so have someone run to the grocery store, bring all your food over to one person's house, hang out together, let the kids play, um, and then split up the food um, to each of your respective households um, that you can uh, eat throughout the week. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very, it can be very, very tricky. Um, I know depending on, I, we moved cities a year ago and, and certainly it was really hard um, the first, uh, um, first little while um, in our new city when we didn't know anyone or, or like didn't know very many people. Um, and it's also kind of interesting like how um, supports changed. Um, so the people who I really thought would be my biggest advocates and biggest supports um, when I chose to adopt um, are not necessarily the people who um, are my biggest supports or advocates right now. Um, people have stepped out of the woodwork, people um, that I haven't spoken to in 15 years or whatever who've stepped up um, and offered supports. Um, we had um, my daughter's bike trailer um, spoken or stolen this summer. Um, and I had someone who I haven't seen since university who got us a new one and brought it to my house and whatever. So it's amazing these like connections that come out. Um, so I think a lot of it is being intentional. Um, yeah, utilizing your resources. So utilizing um, Facebook and other online supports, email, utilizing Adopt for Life um, uh, liaison so that they can connect you to other families who are in, who are in circumstances. Um, but yes, you're right, it's not easy. <laughs> um, so what else can I say here? Uh, oh, and having friends who are um, already adoptive parents um, is a really, really great way um, to set yourself apart um, in the pre-adoptive process um, and to get to know um, what it's actually like in the day-to-day. Uh, so ask your adoption worker for connections, volunteers, uh, volunteer in places um, if you're early in the process um, and or if you're still uh, in the early career stage and in school, uh, perhaps look into helping professions or professions that work directly with children. Uh, if you have kids in your life, so if you have friends um, who have kids with special needs such as autism or ADHD, learning disabilities, etc., speak about their parents or speak to their parents and spend time with those families and actively try to come in contact with kids who have exceptionalities and learn about what the realities of life are um, and be sure to think about um, beyond childhood as well some special needs require uh, care lifelong they need financial support lifelong etc don't fantasize as much as it's really hard to and we all do to an extent um, try your best to be realistic um, think about the realities of going out shopping with your, ch your child or children, um, navigating the school system, uh, think about what wait lists for supported living um, in your community are, um, who you have as backup, um, that kind of thing. Do a lot of soul searching and a little more after that. Uh, the more self-aware and honest you are, the more likely you will be to be chosen, uh, to be successful and to be healthy through the process. Another thing uh, that Teresa and I touched upon is uh, it's not just how you present yourself um, in your meetings <laughs> with your caseworkers. Also, think of it the way you would think about when you're going for a job interview or something. Like, what does your social media look like? What are you portraying? What are you putting out there? <laughs> Maybe <laughs> you might want to clean things up as, as well and make sure that. Um, that the image you're presenting is someone who's really there, ready to ready to become a parent or to expand their family. Okay, um, I'm going to speak a little bit about transitioning. So we have the two scenarios: um, versus becoming a single parent after you've been waiting to match. Um, so 
adoption is pretty much built on dreams. You know, we spend, we spend a few years getting ready, going through that whole process and, uh, and we create this fantasy child in our head and we picture ourselves, you know, running through meadows and um, doing all these lovely things with our kids. And if our child is, is old enough, they will also have built some fantasies around family. Um, they, they may have a fantasy of a two parent family or they may imagine their new parents are gonna be rich or, you know, they, they have their ideas. And, um, and so those are all gonna have to meet with reality as soon as, as, soon as the move-in happens. And you have to be ready for some pretty big feelings around that, both on your kid's part and also on your part. Um, when you're, you may have um, had extended visits with your child before they move in. Um, typically, children who have experienced trauma can, can be quite charming. <laughs> a lot of uh, a lot of single parents I've spoken with um, have said something along the lines of, "The kid I met on visits is not the kid who moved into my house." Um, being charming is often a survival strategy for for kids who've experienced trauma. Um, they've been let down by caregivers. They have maybe been neglected or abused, and um, they'll often reach out to any adult who crosses their path and be extra nice and make sure that they get good attentions from this person. Um, so that may be the child that you meet during visits. The child who moves in is not gonna be able to keep up that facade 24 seven. Um, they may well be very upset to be leaving behind their foster family. They may feel loyalties to their, their birth family and be struggling with accepting um, the idea that they're gonna have a new parent. Um, so you might be meeting with, with grief, with sadness. There will be fun times in between. You will have a lot of moments in the early months um, that live up to your dreams, but uh, you should be ready for all kinds of behaviors. And as we keep saying, have your supports in place. <laughs> have someone to vent to or join those groups so that you can go online at the end of the day when your kid's in bed and you know, talk about these things. Um, and also it's important to accept help when it's offered to you, uh, but to recognize that people don't always know what kind of help you need as a single adoptive parent. So we kind of have this, um, this set bunch of things that we do when somebody goes into hospital and comes out with a newborn baby. You know, we'll bring over food, we'll bring over gifts, and we'll offer to help in lots of little ways. People often don't realize that adoptive parents need support as well. You know, they think that the child being matched with us is our happy ending. Um, especially if your child is not a newborn, they may not realize that, you know, your eight-year-old is not sleeping through the night, that your 12-year-old is waking up screaming, that your 15-year-old is having meltdowns in the subway. They, they don't understand necessarily how challenging it can be in the early months. Um, so... Your job as a single parent is to be very proactive. If you're offered help, you accept it. And then you tell people exactly what kind of help you need. Um, I, I met with a single parent in the early months who'd adopted teen siblings and was having a wild time at home. And she literally got on the phone, called up her friends and said, where are you? I need casseroles, I need lasagna. I need you to treat me as if I had a newborn baby. I'm dying here. And her friends showed up and they helped her out. Um, another thing, um, you may not get the baby shower that your pregnant coworker got. <laughs> If you want the baby shower, you have to ask for it. Um, I, I was lucky that um, I was working at Parenting Magazine at the time and they do a beautiful teen baby shower for me with cake and cookies and gifts for my daughter. Um, my, my dear single friends, um, in their minds, they didn't really fully understand that the adoption was, I was going through all the same nesting feelings as if I were nine months pregnant. And um, instead of offering to come over and help me put up curtain rods or um, get books and clothes for my daughter, they, they wanted to take me out and get drunk a couple of nights before she moved in and go dancing into the middle of the night. And um, so, yeah, you have to kind of, you have to educate people. A lot of people just don't have 
that knowledge about adoption, but they do want to be there for you and they do want to help. Uh, the next scenario when you and your partner separate. So you may be coming to single parenting uh, from the situation of having been a couple. Um, so obviously you're not just dealing there with your child's grief, but you're dealing with your own grief. Um, there may be some relief if it means that fighting has stopped or a difficult situation has come to an end, but typically there's, there's going to be sadness, um, feelings of failure, feelings of guilt. You know, I think any parent who's going through a separation uh, feels, feels guilty, but um, when your children are adopted, you know that they've already been through losing people in their lives. They've already been through instability, and um, it can be quite debilitating to know that your decision um, or what's happening in your life is gonna give them another loss to deal with. Um, so it's okay to express those feelings and to keep things low key for a while. It's okay for your parents, sorry, for your children to see that you're sad or that you're angry. Um, whoop. <laughs> My senior dog. <laughs> Having a senior moment. Um, what's not okay, obviously, is to, um, to make your child your confidant. You don't want to speak poorly of the other parent, even if, They've done terrible, terrible things in your mind. Um, and you don't want to share so much information with your child that they feel overwhelmed and that they have to support you and that they have to take care of your emotional needs. So you need basic information. You need to know what's happening. Um, but obviously, you need to have your grown-up supports in place so you can talk through your own feelings. Um, so it's normal to feel sad, normal to feel angry. If those things last for a long time, more than a few weeks, um, obviously your first priority is the kids. You need to go and get the help that's out there, either seeing your doctor, talking about medication, or talking about therapies. Um, Again, adopt for life, <laughs> talk to your regional parent liaison. Um, but just make sure that you have the support because it will be a difficult time, but you can get through it. Um, the ideal situation is obviously after separation, if you and your ex-partner are able to continue co-parenting as singles. This doesn't always happen. You may find yourself as the sole caregiver for your children afterwards. Um, but if you are co-parenting as singles, uh, it's, it's really good if you're able to discuss how you're gonna do it and try and set up as much consistency as possible. Uh, agree on what the rules are. So your kids have the same bedtime, they have the same curfew, they have the same consequences for any kind of behaviors. Um, and try and keep it civil, keep each other in the loop with what your children are going through so that so that you know you're prepared if your child's had a bad day at school you know that they're going to turn up at your house a little frazzled um all children like consistency but children who've been adopted um they absolutely require it so the best thing you can do for them is try and try and keep that up between the two homes um there is a resource i wanted to tell you about um let me just look at my notes here. Uh, so there's a Facebook group called Positive Co-Parenting After Divorce. Um, and that was set up by Brandy Whiteley, who um, is the founder of the Thousand Parents Project, Thousand Families Project. Um, so she is a divorced uh, single parent and she co-parents with her husband who lives in the house next door and their children go from one house to the next. So they've spent a lot of time um, setting up a very civil situation that works really well for their kids. And she's committed to um, helping other parents who are trying to establish the same kind of thing for their kids. So um, I think that's a great resource if you find yourself going from couple to single. Back to you, <laughs> Teresa. So uh, we've already touched on, on lots of uh, things here, but um, the nitty and gritty actually, when's your parenting? Um, so while we all know that single adoptive parents possess unique advantages, uh, such as with children um, who've experienced trauma or attachment, 
uh, where that single parent household, uh, they'll experience a higher degree of consistency and emotional safety than with a dual parent family. We also know that we need to be mindful um, and prepare for finding positive role models um, of someone of the opposite gender. It's not unusual for kids of single parents to be drawn to adult strangers uh, of the other gender um, and that our kids crave it and want to understand it. So it's important to be intentional about this and to try to make opportunities uh, for it or undesirable situations can arise. Uh, my daughter <laughs> calls any middle-aged man pretty much dad. Um, <laughs> so um, it's made for some awkward Uber rides when she calls the driver dad. <laughs> and they're kind of not really sure what to do. Um, she also likes, uh, part of her, she has some battery issues normally, but um, we're, when we're out and about, she'll just grab random strangers' men's hands, like when we're on the TPC or um, just walking down the street. Um, and... Uh, so it's, we talk a lot about positive uh, boundaries, um, about safety, uh, that kind of thing. Um, but I know that there is this innate um, question around um, men and like what, how, how are they involved in my life, that kind of thing. Um, so I try to be intentional about the time uh, that we spend uh, with some role model med um, in our life. Um, when we sign up for, for classes or sports, um, if possible, I ask her to be uh, paired with male coaches um, who can be a positive influence. Uh, I do my best at small family events uh, for her to have one-on-one -on -one time um, with her grandpa. At larger family events um, with her uncles um, to get that one-on-one -on -one time or, or time with their kids and, and their dad. Um, when we're spending time with friends, I allow her to gravitate and learn uh, from the relationships our friends' um, dads have with their kids. Because it's really, it's natural and it's okay. Um, we talk about it a lot um, and we work with where my daughter's at. It's not easy, like I said, there's been some awkward moments and, and uh, she scares me a lot with, uh, with what she'll be like when she gets older and, and some situations she might put herself in. Um, but things have gotten better um, with time and age and, and with the uh, these intentional interactions, um, she's getting more and more appropriate. Um, but just to know that that's like normal, it happens to a lot of kids. Um, so try to be intentional about um, finding someone that can be a good role model or multiple people. And now kind of as uh, has been talked about, self-care as a single can be really, really hard. Um, one of the lessons that is so important early on, as we've said multiple times, is to ask for help. Um, acknowledge that it's hard and that it's okay to need help. When we've got no backup, it's so important to have that help. And unless we ask, people don't know to offer and they won't offer in most circumstances. Um, I wish people could read my mind, and once I figure that out, I'll let you know. Um, but uh, they can't see into my everyday exhaustion, and they can't um, know what I need, so I need to engage them. I mentioned in the comments that um, one of my regrets is not being um, direct in those early stages and asking people to throw that shower, to bring those meals, uh, because I really do feel like my, my friends would have um, if I had asked, but I didn't ask. So I'm telling you to ask. <laughs> Um, the same adoption worker I mentioned earlier um, said strong informed supports play a huge role in the health of an adoptive family and self-care of the parent. They can go a long way in preventing depression and isolation while promoting health, resilience, and happiness. I don't believe you can have one without the other. Well-supported single parents are in a better position to network with other adoptive parents, get out to groups, events, exercise, socialize, handle school issues, interruptions, deal with medical, therapeutic needs of the child, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the time for this process is to begin at the very beginning, as soon as the applicant decides to adopt from CAS. I asked some single parents what their advice uh, would be, um, give someone thinking about single adoptive parenting, and the resounding answer was a support system. Uh, one parent commented, my advice to a person considering being a single parent, uh, no matter what you have convinced yourself of, yes, you really do need trusted babysitters. A few family, friends, neighbors, um, someone who will take your sweet child at the drop of a hat on the days when you aren't sure how you're going to get through the day. They will know and love your child, but that even you with your infinite love need a break sometimes so you can get up again and love them more. This includes parents of older kids, and uh, I really want to emphasize that. 
um, that uh, she said, I'm eternally grateful to the people who are, who immediately said, yes, I'm on my way and took my child out for a movie or even a sleepover sometimes when we're having really bad adjustment days. And now on the older, surely teenager days. Um, and I think, I mean, my daughter was, was five when she came to me and I thought because she was in school, I wasn't going to need the full adoption leave. Um, or, um, just that I, you know, I would have the time to do this, this, and this. Um, but the reality is you, you're going to need that leave and you're going to need, um, those supports, um, right from, from the beginning. So when the supports are there, use them and, and be direct. Um, another one of the, the parents said, no matter how much fam your family and friends say they would help, expect that you're going to need even more help um, and, and look for it early in the process. Um, another said, different kinds of supports have been helpful for me, um, other families to connect with and for um, my child to play with, um, places to get out of the house on cold rainy days, emotional supports and friends to be there when things are tough, adoptive parent friends who really get it, practical supports um, who can run errands or, uh, or something in a pinch, childcare supports, et cetera. Um, it really does take a village uh, and the wider and deeper your village runs, the easier it is. Um, and, uh, yeah. There's a couple of comments here that we have um, talking about people saying that they're there for me. Um, but when I ask, they're busy with their own lives, they're still asking. Um, so, and then we have some agreement from another parent. Um, that does happen. I think that our, our friends can be very romantic about what it's going to be like before the child comes along. Um, from my own experience um, with both my children, I find that the best people to try and connect with are other single parents because they have the same needs as you do. You can have each other's back. It's not a one-way relationship. And like Teresa suggested, you you know you don't have to get together for things like um, movies or trampoline. And you can get together to cook food together, for your kids to watch TV together. You can form your own little mini family for an afternoon. Um, but yeah, try and try and identify other single parents if possible in your community. And I think another. Um, uh finding your own interests as well or your kids interests so get involved with um if it's photography like find a photography group um if it's a church like get involved with the church um i know i i'm an introvert and so uh, i like to spend my free time at home by myself and so i have to be very intentional about um getting out and making those connections um and phases in life are easier and harder um but i think again it's that being um, being intentional and I get the I stop asking um, I've been like that um, as well and then I, I have to kind of regroup and either find new people to ask or don't stop asking um, so it's tricky though it's it's so tricky um, and depending on who you are and what your kids needs are um, I know I have very few people I can leave my daughter with because of her how her her needs are um, so it's it's yeah inviting people to my house as opposed to going out places um, that kind of thing um, yeah so very much depends on your situation um, but you're right it's it's hard and uh, uh, and depending on who you are and, and where you are um, can be harder or easier. Um, and I think someone just mentioned found uh, great strength, strength in myself in the process. And I think that's one of the biggest things, and I mentioned it later as well. Um, but commend yourself. Like, don't... Um, we, it's hard, right? So single parenting is hard. And so talk about, remind yourself how great you are doing um, and that things are busy, um, but look at how far your kids come or um, look, you got out of bed this morning or look, you're dressed or look, you fed your, your child breakfast. Like commend yourself on these things. Um, some days on, on hard days uh, when I'm like, what did I do today? Like, how did I spend all my time? I will actually write a, a to-do list um, of things I've already done and check them off. It makes me feel better about myself that I did all of these things, even if it was like brush your teeth, um, go to the washroom, whatever. Um, give yourself uh, your own applause if no one else is giving it to you um, because you are doing great and single parenting is e isn't easy. Um, I hope that I hope that kind of touched on it. Val, did you want to say something else? No. Okay. <laughs> Just uh, sometimes when. 
when I hear um, parents who are in couples and, you know, one of them's away on a business trip for two days or something and they're like, oh, I've been single parenting. <laughs> <laughs> All I can think is, what a baby. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, do, you, you have to be proud of yourself and your strength and the fact that you're doing it all alone and, um, and you do become strong and it does make you awesome. <laughs> you yeah. don't always feel that way, but um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and just remembering that self-care can look different for everyone as well. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I love personality tests and all that kind of stuff. I could uh, learn more about personalities all day long. Um, and I recently found uh, an account on Instagram um, that's in uh, about any, the Enneagram. Um, if you've never heard of it, I can message you, but it's very interesting. Um, and so one of the posts she talked about was uh, self-care for each of the different types. Um, and it was mind blowing to me how different it looked for each of the different types. Um, so some of her suggestions were get to know yourself and what your needs are. It could be anything from practicing a brain dump of all the things taking up space in your thoughts. Um, it can be setting a boundary or doing something invigoratingly goofy or vulnerable or bringing more structure to your day. It could be saving up for something that seems really frivolous, or it could be daily walks, meditation, or spending time giving back, either through uh, spending time with your family or doing volunteer work. Or it could be taking yourself on a date where you do what you want to do when, with no one else's input. Um, generally, though, I think setting a time, aside time for just you um, so that we can recoup um, and reconnect to ourselves. Um, maybe take a hot bath with some music, um, get your hair professionally washed, um, go for a walk or drive someplace you find relaxing, or turn the TV on for your kid or give them the iPad and go take a nap and don't feel guilty about it. Uh, look for time savers in your life. Um, I recently bought an Instant Pot and as I'm kind of figuring it out, it's amazing. Um, those little like time saver things that, uh, um, that can help. Um, meal planning ahead of time, um, that's another big one. So you don't spend um, the half an hour you get home after work um, eating, like looking in the fridge, looking in the cupboard, like what I'm going to make. So set aside 15 minutes um, uh, during the week and make a, a meal plan for the rest of the week. Um, and then the also the important thing about self-care is making sure you're healthy. Um, so make healthy food choices whenever you can. Drink enough water, exercise regularly, spend time outside. Um, watch a funny show, um, order takeout if you're just not feeling up for, uh, for cooking, uh, cry into your pillow. Um, and I'm sure we've all heard the airplane mantra of uh, make sure you put the oxygen mask on yourself before you put it on anyone else. I think we as parents need to, in particular, remember that because our kids don't have that backup. They don't have that other person who can put the mask on them, but we really need to remember to put it on ourselves first. Because our kids need us, and we, and we also need to show them by example um, how to take care of yourself. Um, Val mentioned the Pathways to Permanence course. That's a great way. Um, as well as making your friends with Adopt for Life. So ask your parent liaison uh, for buddy matches. Um, join our single parents group and, and get connected there. Um, create a virtual buddy system. So it's amazing how these online communities um, can support you on your journey. I know I'm, I'm part of a few um, with some of my daughter's needs and it's amazing how um, even if we don't live in the same city or sometimes even the province, same province or country, how someone who's living the same um, virtual life as you um, gets it in a way that other people don't. So, so find those virtual buddies. Um, if you're still early in the process uh, of and doing pride training, get connected with those people. Um, if you get a lunch break, um, see if someone can meet you on your lunch break, even um, for 10 minutes with for having coffee or lunch together. Um, make a play date if you're home on uh, adoption leave or, or on a weekend. Um, go to the library with your kids, uh, but go together. Um, have them come to your place, but don't clean up before they come. Just be who you are uh, and let your expectations uh, drop. If you're having a really bad day um, or a bad moment and you can't get out of the situation or leave your house, text a friend. Um, don't feel like you have to speak to them. Just get it out. Um, get it out into the world and be real about how things are. And what I talked about earlier is having those people to, uh, to dump um, things on who they know that you're not giving up or not uh, throwing in a towel on this, but that just you need to get these, these frustrating feelings and days out. Um, and that's okay. I think we all um, need that. 
Yeah, I have sent many texts to tears over the last the last few years. It's, it's very therapeutic. Um, Amazon Prime, yes, go Amazon Prime. <laughs> yeah, we have some really good uh, suggestions here. So Gina and Crystal, they're talking about um, using online shopping services from uh, yeah. places like Superstore and Amazon Prime. And um, yeah, I, I can remember one time in my old uh, my old home, we had a, a neighborhood grocery store that delivered and I called up and um, I ordered chocolate in a snowstorm and <laughs> somebody brought it over. <laughs> I ordered milk as well, so it didn't look so bad. <laughs> but yeah, anything that helps. <laughs> um. And then one parent shared that I think um, you can be your own greatest supports as well. Um, so learning to unplug, learning to sleep, rest, drink water, relax, and boost yourself so that you can do it. Remind yourself how great you're doing. Um, along the same vein though, um, not having someone else who has the same vested interest in your child is tough. Um, like we've kind of all talked about. Um, it can it can feel really hard. Um, big medical decisions, a loss in the family, added traumas. Um, I think it's also why it's so important for single adopters to support each other. Um, we are in a unique, a unique situation and well placed to understand the deeper challenges. Um, I think too um, that while you may not have the right supports right now, that doesn't necessarily mean you can't still parent um, and can't work on growing those supports. Um, so this person talked about that she has a friend in another, another province who went through, um, went to a few adopting as a single events and she knew she didn't have the supports they mentioned. Um, she had older frail parents and her siblings um, were in another province. Um, so in the end, she turned down a referral for a baby out of guilt that she couldn't provide a close knit family. She's since met so many amazing people who would not have or who would have supported her um, that she feels she made a huge decision solely on worrying about not having a family support system instead of realizing that she was lacking it right now, but she could and would continue working on growing it. Um, in her case, a niece moved into the province um, and comes over weekly. She had met a new woman at church who adopted in similar circumstances. She met a couple new friends at work who are great people, and she feels that it's a a terrible regret that she let guilt and fear over a lack of support system stop her. So it's important to have people that you turn to, but it will look different for everyone. Um, she said she has a friend um, whose sibling takes her child two nights a week uh, from placement. I wish. <laughs> Um, so she can sleep um, but many people aren't looking for that even uh, for them just having someone to call on a hard day or someone to invite them over for the holidays can make a huge difference I said in her early days my three biggest supports um, she had no family on the continent um, her three supports were her boss a friend from university that she hadn't seen in 10 years um, and her best friend who was in another country who phoned her every single weekend no matter what was going on that hour every weekend made her able to breathe. Uh, by the time her third child came into her family, she had a, such a long list of supports that she felt guilt, guilty asking some people to be references and not others. Um, so you just never know what's around the corner. So be intentional. Um, listen to your body. Listen to your heart. Listen to your mind. Take a break when you need one and don't feel guilty about it. If you don't have the support network, you need right now. Um, if you've had friends you thought would be there for you, um, for life, leave, um, be intentional in building that network up. Well, it's incredibly hard to make the effort when you're really already scraping at the bottom of the bucket. Putting those efforts in now will help you get to that supportive place. Okay, um, so there's some things that you have to think about very carefully as a single, obviously. Uh, the first one is dating. Um, so I want to talk about that from the perspective if you are an awaiting parent, an intentional single parent, and um, you're happy for your home study. <laughs> so I just wanted to point out that um, it's really important if you start dating during that time that you let your caseworker know. <laughs> it may be possible to conceal at first, but it's not going to be forever. And and likely, you know, the relationship between um, between your partner 
and your kid like things will come up over time once they've moved in so you have to be very transparent about it and that way um, you're able to find solutions for any difficult situations as they come up and get the help of your caseworker um, also uh, if your relationship does become more serious and you've applied as a single you may find that you're asked to postpone the application process and that can be super frustrating and disappointing if you've already done all that work to get this far. Um, I just wanted to point out there is a good reason for it though. Um, adoption, adoptive parenting, I think of as extreme parenting. It, it can be more challenging. Our kids come to us with extra needs and it's I don't think it's fair to um, to start a new relationship trying to grapple with all these extra needs with a kid and trying to you know to give everything you want to give to your spouse as well so it's good to try and set things in place with your child first and then date or if you're already dating set things in place with your partner wait and then bring in the child and don't try and do everything at once um, so if you are a single parent, your child has moved in with you and you're dating, um, just a few things that you're going to want to think about. Um, first of all, if you're preparing to date, maybe check in with the people around you, see what they think. It, you know, is your kid really settled in? Um, are they comfortable in your new home? Are they secure in your relationship? Um, even though it can be hard to to push off dating, sometimes it's really worth it just so you can keep the focus on your kid until they're really secure and then move on to that next stage. Um, your kid really deserves your attention for the first while. Um, dating as well, you know, it obviously it plays with your emotions, it doesn't always go as you planned and you want in those early months and even that, that first year or two, um, to be a really solid and stable parent so that you can be consistent with your kids and give them what they need. Um, when you do start dating, um, you're gonna have to sit down and set your own criteria for when to introduce a new partner. Obviously your kids have already, <clears throat> they've had a lot of adults um, come into their lives and leave their lives. So <clears throat> if you want to bring somebody new in, you kind of want to, make sure that this is not somebody who's gonna be leaving in the next few weeks um so you know this is something to bounce off your friend to talk about with your partner and try and find the best time to introduce them um your partner may well have no idea what adoption looks like um what it means what your child's special needs mean what it's like for a child to um receive therapeutic parenting that may look very different from the kind of parenting that they want to give so it's good to really um, talk those things through with your partner give them things to read <laughs> sign them up for courses if it's getting serious but make sure that, that they're adoption informed to give your relationship the best chance of working once you take it to the next level um, so if you're planning on extending, expanding your family as a single, it goes back to that very first thing we spoke about um, where on the one hand, you get to make that all decisions yourself and you can move fast. On the other hand, you have no one to bounce your decisions off. So if you're thinking about growing your family, like it's, it's a really good idea to talk with the people who know you well, the people who've observed your situation settling in with your existing child or children, and it can give you some feedback on whether they think that now is a good time, whether you're ready. Um, if you don't have somebody close in your life in that position, again, you can reach out with your regional parent liaison, um, talk things to, ask what they think. Um, and if you're at the point where you've decided to go ahead and you're starting to receive files and your caseworker wants to match you, you can also show those files and talk through the needs of the child and uh, whether they would be a really good fit for your situation. So try and make sure you have someone to help keep it real and bounce things off and make sure that you do things when your family's ready. Um, I'm gonna get super depressing now and bum you out before we get to the Q&A. 
<laughs> so any parent has to think about what happens when the worst happens. When you're a single parent, it's more dramatic. So if you become very ill for a long time, uh, if you become disabled, um, if there's an emergency, if you lose your job, if um, somebody else in your family gets very sick and needs your care, you know, you need to have things planned before all that stuff happens so you know what you would do if they happened and um, that's going to allow you to feel a lot less stressed in the day to day. Um, so, you know, talk these things to make a plan, uh, consult with a financial planner. Um, to have the practical things set out. Uh, think about insurances, look at what's out there. Um, but just make sure you give those things a, a think <laughs> as you're expanding your family. And then in terms of estate planning, um, if you guys are in the adoptive parents group, I started a thread yesterday to ask people <laughs> the question of how they choose um, the guardian for their child, should the worst happen and should they pass away. And it's, it's a really tricky question for adoptive parents. And it's a really crucial question if you're the only one there. Um, so some of the suggestions that came up um, are, were really interesting. The first thing is the person that you choose at the start of your journey when you're preparing to adopt and when you first write your will um, may not be the person you would choose a few years later. Um, a lot of our friendships pre-adoption, they change, some of them fade away, and we become closer to often to other people who have more in common with our family situation as we, as we move through our journey. So it's a good idea to revisit your will every three years, look at who the named guardian is, and reassess whether that is the person still um, who would be the best person for your child. Um, other things you want to take into consideration are any special needs that your child has. Um, so if you're thinking of naming, for example, a grandparent as a guardian, would they have the energy and would they have the ability to help your child? Um, you want to look for someone who has a similar parenting style to you, uh, perhaps a similar faith, someone who lives geographically close so your child doesn't have to go through another entire life change. Um, so these are all good things to, to weigh up and think about and to reevaluate as the years go on. Um, so that's, that's the most depressing part over. Um, so I just, before we, we wrap up and move on to questions, I just want to re-emphasize that I love single parenting. I love being a parent and it's one of the most fulfilling things I do. Definitely not easy. There's definitely sometimes tears. Sometimes I'm <laughs> in my room with the door closed, hugging one of the dogs <laughs> and thinking, what have I done? And, um, but there's, there's so much good in it that I'm really glad that I made that decision. And, um, and I, hope that, I hope that you do too. Um, it's gonna be the hardest thing you've done. It's gonna be the best thing you've ever done. So Teresa, um, has left a few words of advice here. Believe in yourself, believe in your new family, and go out and shine. So we're ready to start taking questions. <laughs> I know we've kind of done, done that as we've gone through, but if there's anything else that's kind of come up, or um, if Val's dog has questions about dating, we're happy to answer that. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Anybody? Anybody? Can we play our all single ladies song again? <laughs> There's a long question here. Who is this from? Uh, do you have to tell someone you're dating if it begins after finishing your home study, especially if it's not serious? Ooh. So I said, it's important to be honest throughout the process. Um, um, I said, if uh, you're not serious, um, say that to the worker um, because you just never know what the future holds, um, but that it's good to be transparent. Um, but if you're in the process of your home studies finished and you're just waiting to be matched, um, 
it is a bit of a tricky situation. Um, but I think as soon as things even remotely start to get serious, absolutely, you need to be uh, transparent with your workers and let them know. Um, yeah, I did have a friend um, who told me about another um, woman that she knew who was in the process of becoming a doc ready and she almost had her file shut down because she concealed uh, that she was in a relationship um and of course her work did find out i mean it's you know at the point when it becomes important to you, it's it's not something that you can talk about your life and not mention it so transparency yeah um, so there's a question um can there be a role for Adopt for Life in advocating for single parenting with CAS to counteract some of the biases and with some of the facts mentioned before? Absolutely, 100%. We can write letters, we can attend meetings, um, whatever you need. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna quickly go to um, this slide here. Um, so talking about for the resources and one of the things at the very bottom, um, you'll see we're starting our virtual support group for singles. Yay! Um, so starting next um, Thursday, I think that's this Thursday. I don't know what day it is anymore. The 31st, <laughs> this Thursday coming up at 9 p.m. Um, we will send a link out. We'll post it in the, uh, this, the Facebook um, the single parent Facebook group um, that uh, we're hoping can be a good um, resource for single parents. I know I have a really hard time getting out uh, to support groups just because of like bedtimes and not being able to, my, my daughter refuses to sleep for anyone else. Um, so I'm really excited about this opportunity and um, that you can pop in kind of as you need. Um, we're hoping to do it monthly. If this time is horrible, um, please let me know because we can, we can tweak it or even um, monthly, perhaps we could do one at 9 p.m. and then the following month we could do one on a weekend or, or whatever works. So please let me know um, what would be ideal um, for you. We have a, a question here. Um, sorry, I'm just going to scroll back up again. Um, was the financial adjustment massive at the beginning, going from single expenses to costs of daycare, etc.? So I think we probably both have a different experience here, Teresa. Um, from my perspective, I, I adopted an older child. I already had a child in the house. And there is a subsidy that comes with um, adopting a child, I believe, of age eight and over, um, which significantly helped me. So in my case, I, I didn't see a huge change. And my child was of an age where she didn't need to take care and babysitters and after school care. So we were fortunate in that way. Um, her hair expenses, however, <laughs> very expensive. <laughs> I adopted an African Canadian, African -Canadian girl who <laughs> has um, very beautiful braids. <laughs> I haven't had my hair cut in 18 months, basically, <laughs> before she lived in. Uh, Teresa. Um, so interestingly enough, I would actually say I was better off after my daughter came home, um, which is, I know, not uh, normal circumstances, but my daughter has uh, has a disability. Um, so, and based on my income level, I was able to get some supports from CAS um, that helped financially, as well as the child tax credit plus the disability tax credit. So in, in the end, I was actually making um, more money, ironically, um, than I was before my daughter came home. Um, however, childcare costs can be quite outrageous and so um, my daughter was school age but I did need to find after school care for her as well as uh, care in the summer um, then uh, uh, that yeah that was very expensive and because she has special needs um, she just couldn't go to regular programs so we had to do um, special had to do special needs programming um, a minimum $20 an hour um, so those kind of expenses really really add up quickly um, and see so it's just being mindful um, in the end I actually went down to part-time work which is um, why I started working for adopt life um, so that all of my expenses were going into child care um, so yeah. Got some some tips here on getting my daughter's hair done cheaper. <laughs> Introduce me to these people. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> they all leave me. <laughs> I've become an expert in oil treatments. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> um, I see a question in the Q&A as well, um, which I'll read out. It says, my worker doesn't seem to believe I can build up a support system once I adopt. Any advice? Val, you can go first if you want. Um, I don't think that's true, but I definitely think that it will reassure your worker to see that you already have some supports in place. And, you know, they're not going to challenge you if those supports change over time, as long as you have supports and as long as they can see that, um, that you're coping and that you're able to get through difficult times they're going to be happy um but i i think it's understandable if a worker is assessing your situation and sees that you appear to be quite isolated that they will be concerned about adding extra stresses into your life and yeah so i think like be honest about or talk about the ways that you will develop those supports um so talk about your interests um or the things you'll get involved with your child um talk about um that you're already involved with adopt for life um talk about things you've done with adopt ontario like webinars you've done or groups you've participated in um the places that you'll be able to build on those supports um yeah, because I think we both talked about, um, I know my, my group of friends certainly shifted quite significantly um, from before I adopted to after, um, and people stepped in that I didn't expect, and people stepped away that I had expected, expected to step up. Um, so I think um, it's, yeah, just uh, talk about what you would do, so how you're going to build those supports. Um, I don't know which community you live in or, or kind of what your interests are, but look into th the things that exist in your community. Um, does that, I hope that helps. Does that help? If it doesn't, let me know. I think a lot of people feel that um, there's a bias as well towards family support, so they'll be like, where is your family? So if you're living far from your own extended family, that can raise some questions. Um, and I think that as a single parent, you have to be really, or as a single person, you have to be really confident in presenting your friends as friends who are family. You know, if, if the people in your life or friends are very close to you, then that matters just as much as, as having a sister in the same street or a cousin down the road. Okay, we've got a question. I'm almost three years in waiting for placement and I wonder sometimes if it's about the parameters. Did you find you had to adjust your parameters for the child you could adopt? That's a great question. I think a lot of people, yes. Um, and I think especially as singles because um, <laughs> again, those, uh, um, those biases still exist. And so I think it's, um, yeah, opening, opening yourself up to, uh, um, to different parameters, um, uh, but being honest as well. Um, so I think, um, I know Val was very intentional about the age group she adopted. She like, because of being a single and, and what supports and that kind of thing. Um, uh, so yeah, looking at what your life um, would look like um, and maybe like speaking to your, ask your worker directly to say like, why, is there any reasons that I haven't been matched yet? What would, um, what would I do to help myself be matched? Would opening my parameters help that? Uh, would, you know, doing this kind of, so, um, because they're the ones who are doing the matching. So I think asking specific questions, if they're not able to, uh, um, uh, to answer, uh, that's trickier, but, um, I think going to things like the Adoption Resource Exchange is another great one and a great way to get your name out there and, and show your interest. Um, yeah, the waiting is really hard. <laughs> it's, it's a different hard when you're parenting, but, but yeah, waiting, waiting is really hard. And I, I think, um, yes, you have to look at your parameters and consider opening them, but at the same time, um, you have to, you have to bear in mind your own limitations as a single. So um if the potential match is a child whose needs are far more significant than what you had already identified you're able to cope with um and it's really important to know yourself and to know your limits and to know your <laughs> what kind of support you have around you then um you know i don't think it's it's necessarily wise to just blow open the parameters to the point that you find yourself in a situation that's it's just going to be very, very hard. 
Okay. Yeah, I, th I think you have to. a lot of it as well with the matching process. Um, I, you know, I think that sometimes when we're awaiting parents, we expect that we get to the end of the line, we're approved, and then our caseworker is going to show up with four files and be like, <laughs> which of these kids do you want? But um, nowadays, um, what I'm seeing for singles and couples is that. Um, you kind of, you sometimes kind of have to go out there and find your kids. You have to go on the um, Adopt Ontario website, go to the ARE. You you really have to um, be quite proactive sometimes to to get that match. I'm trying to think if we missed any questions here. The single parent group name. Oh, I just I just sent that info. Um, let me know, and I just saw a request come through, so it must be one of you. Um, if I'll add a note, um, I can't officially add you to the group until you're a member of Adopt for Life and you've done your intake. Um, so if you haven't, um, if you aren't a member yet, here, let me go to my next screen on the slides. Um, uh, make sure you um, you join our community um, and then um, I'll pro if, if I don't see your name in our Adopt for Life system, I'll, I'll send you a private message and uh, you can say that you were part of this webinar and I can try and um, either connect you directly with the person who's going to do your intake or do it myself um, so we can get you hooked up to the group um, as we get to the um, Okay. So if that's for the questions, maybe we could wrap up. Sounds good. Look at this, we're even like on time, Val. I'm so proud of us. <laughs> <laughs> so there's uh, myself and Val's contact information. Um, thank you all for coming today and for, for being active participants. We are, we're yeah, we're so happy that we could do this. And um, if there's any outstanding questions, we'll stay on for a little longer. Um, and please, uh, don't hesitate to reach out, join our Facebook group, um, and, uh, and, and uh, get connected to our singles um, support group that's coming up. Um, and uh, we're excited to get to know you, and, and we'd love to do more of these. Um, so please, if there's specific topics you wish um, that we could delve more into, um, please tell us, um, and we'd love to do that. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, should we wrap up or do we need Catherine to leave? Catherine, are you still there? <laughs> I'm gonna record forever. I'm here.